Hello, I'm your host Jim McLean, and welcome back to another episode of the Bandaflix Movie Review Show here on NVTV. Joining me in the studio this evening is Alan Meeben. Hi. And Joe McElroy. Hi, Jim. Hello to you both. As always, with a packed show, loads we're going to try and fit into within the half hour, but let's have a look at what we've lined up tonight. We'll be reviewing The Zone of Interest, which is out in cinemas now. We'll chat about The Zen Diary, which will be screening at the QFT next month as part of the Japan Foundation's Turing Film Programme. And our love season continues with Brian Mulholland's pick, The Red Balloon. So that's what we've lined up for you tonight. So loads of things uh, we could talk about moving news-wise before we get into this week's first review. Reading up, of course, as we record, we're just waiting for the Super Bowl. Will she be there? Will she won't? We don't know if Taylor Swift is going to make it from Japan in time to get back to watch the Super Bowl. But of course that means there's, there's loads of trailers. As we record, we haven't seen them. I think a few have been teased already. The, the latest trailer I think looks quite funny for uh, F, the John Krasinski uh, directed feature, which does not feature John Krasinski in, in the trailer. It's quite funny. Check it out, viewers, if you haven't seen that. Reading, and I believe me, I know you will both gentlemen be as shocked as I am. I do do research for this show. We may have another Jurassic World film. I think it's in the works. There's talks about hiring a new director. And also reading that James Cameron is uh, muting the idea of possibly doing an Avatar 6 and 7. We haven't even got the third one out yet. Al, I know you will be very excited about that, but we'll come to you in a bit. But of course, last week, just after the show had aired, we got the sad news that Carl Weathers had passed away. People know Carl Weathers from quite a few things. We, you know, we have the likes of, of obviously, the Rocky movies. We have uh, Predator, Chubbs, and many Adam Sandler projects, and more recently, The Mandalorian. Now, Alan, not that we would out you, when we sat down to, to say this and talk what we'll be talking in this section of the show, you said, who was Carl Weathers. You're going to definitely out me on TV. I am out in you I on TV. I haven't been following the the, uh, the news. But I mean, there, it feels like this year we've had a number of kind of big people that actually mean a lot. If you're from a certain age, then there's a set of films that you saw at a certain time that you, when you went to the cinema with your family or your friends after school or something on a Friday, and we're starting to kind of see the, the sad passing of those people. I mean, to think that they're kind of rocky, which is that stalwart of, I mean, it's, it's now a really low res, kind of, <laughs> there isn't a proper Blu-ray version of it, you, know, you just can't make it good, and yet there's those kind of people who actually carried that kind of film through that has gone. Well that's a very good save. It um, is. That is a very good save Alan, because I was going to be very flippant there and say we'll go to Joe, but you've, you've saved yeah. that, you've brought it back, yes, I mean it was sad news, um, I know a few years ago with, with Covid I've lost track of time, he was here in Belfast for the Comic Con, I've said it in the past openly, I mean, I didn't have the best of interviews with the man, unfortunately, but that could have just been due to the hustle bustle of a Comic-Con. I've heard a lot of good things about him, and I do love him in, I guess, particularly for me as Dylan in the Predator movies. I can't say the line right now. We're pre-Watershed that uh, his exchange with Arnold, but uh, I can't say it, but I'll maybe, you know, off air. Joe, I know when we mentioned this, we were talking about this before we started to record the other day, actually, because you and I went to the cinema to see the film, Zone of Interest, which we're going to be reviewing shortly. You, you, were, you were caught up about this. Yeah, it was actually. Um, it's just because the likes of those films you've already alluded to have been part of my like, childhood growing up, like obviously the Rocky films. I remember watching, there was like a season of it in RT of all places, like every Thursday evening, they had one of the five shown. Uh, and I stopped before along with <laughs> Apollo. Um, and then The Predator, um, I remember watching that multiple times when I was younger, and then uh, Happy Gilmore. It was the film that, you know, the, the TV that you would wheel out in the middle of a classroom. That was the film we had, so I've seen it about five or six times just from the time in secondary school. So he's always been in the bout, and then it was nice for him to sort of come back into the public consciousness again with the likes of The Mandalorian. Now, I mentioned there in my little kind of rambly introduction to loads of movie news that's happened in the last couple of days, uh, mentioned Avatar. A toy with kind of starting them, and then I realised how long they are and how blue they look, um, not in terms of content, but in terms of what they look like and the characters. And I kind of, I do wonder though whether if he's thinking about doing, is it, anyway, there's a X and Y, uh, the next ones, whether it's it's probably getting cheaper and easier to do. So what started off as really technically complicated um, is actually becoming much more uh, straightforward to do. 
I mean, probably the technical stuff is getting more complicated in the background to make it even nicer. But actually, at some point, um, it'll be worth spending an entire weekend starting with one and going to the other to go, actually, that's really, oh, you know, that's, that's very old looking. And suddenly it looks very good. But anyway, that's still ahead of me. And I still haven't, you know, the longer I hold out, the more time I have in life without having to go there. But I'm assuming, Joe, I am missing out. We haven't even had the third one out in cinemas yet. I think it's next year, possibly, mm -hmm. it's going to be released. Uh, I know Vin Diesel is going to be in, involved, so hopefully family will be a big thing, as it is with all the Avatar movies. But the thought of seven instalments within this franchise, initially I was like, oh, that's so much. But then we think of how many films we have within the MCU, how many films we're now going mm -hmm. to have in the upcoming years, potentially with this new DC universe that we're going to have that's going to be retooled with the new Superman movie. Joe, you, you, I know you and I have done a podcast about uh, James Cameron. I mean, we've, we've done already the first two Avatar films. You're fan, you, you enjoy them. As do I. I have a soft spot for them. I do think the last one is a little bit kind of outdated in some of its ideas, but you ready to hang in there to, to the seventh instalment if it, if it was to happen? Well, probably longer than James Cameron's going to be able to hang in, you know, given the rate the films are coming out and how old he's getting. But I think he even mentioned, I'll probably not be able to make the sixth and seventh one. But uh, yeah, like you were saying, the next one's out next year and it involves fire. He seems to be going through these elemental phases through each of the films. Um, I am looking forward to it. I, like, it's any time James Cameron's announced that he's going to make another film, I'm, I'm going to be there opening night. You know, he's... One of the, well, it's hard to say, like he's underrated, he's not underrated, he's obviously got his plot and plot it's both critically and through the box office, but sometimes he's a bit underappreciated. People just think of him now as, oh, he's the Avatar guy, when he's been so much more, he's been so influential, not just in terms of the Avatar films, but developing film technology as well through these films. That's why they've probably taken so long mm -hmm. to wait for the technology to catch up to his ideas. Uh, but yeah, I'm all in for it, why not? Keep it going. Okay, well look, those are films that aren't out yet. I mean, God knows when the seventh instalment will eventually hit cinemas. Hopefully we're still going to the cinema by the time the seventh instalment is out, if it happens. But look, those are films in the future. I think we'll move on now and talk about films we have seen. Heute auch Rosmarin, hier ist rote Beete, das ist Fenchel, die Rüben. Sonnenblumen hier. Und hier ist der Kohlrabi, die Kinder essen wahnsinnig viel Kohlrabi. Die herrliche Zeit, die wir im gastlichen Hause Hörs verlebten, wird immer mit zu unseren schönsten Urlaubsländern herumgehören. Im Osten steht unser Morgen. Herzlichen Dank für eure nationalsozialistische Gastfreundschaft. So that's a look at the Zone of Interest, the latest film from Jonathan Glazer. Previous feature was Under the Skin. Of course, people might as well know him from Sexy Beast, which is now we've got a kind of reboot of that on Paramount as a TV series. But this is something very different to Sexy Beast, something very different to Under the Skin. So here we have his loose adaptation of Martin Amos's novel dealing with Rudolf Huss and his family life as they live literally meters from Auschwitz. I will say right from the get-go, I'm gonna pick this up because I was looking up how I could describe this. And in itself, Google itself describes the zone of interest in a nutshell, unsettling, heavy, and somber. And I can't top that, that's, that's my review. Um, that's my thoughts towards this film. Uh, we will see what my two guests think Joe, start with you. You and I went to see this in the cinema. We went to see it at the QFT last night. So what's your thoughts? Well, the thing is, right, when we came out of it, we both sort of turned each other's like, you know, we, there's something about this film. It's not a film we can say that we love because it's not that kind of film, obviously, given the subject matter. But I think it was myself that turned you. It's like, I really admire 
that film for what it, it is and what it's trying to do and the type of story it's trying to tell in and around the Holocaust. For me, it's the whole aspect of it, the indifference to everything that's happening that's, you know, uh, just really sticks with you and haunts you more than anything with the film. And the way Glazer achieves that's fantastic. Like, we both praised the sound design as well. Last night, I think it's some of the best sound design I've heard, I've heard in a film in many years because it's not a graphic film in, by any means, but the sound is the thing that'll stick with you more than any image possibly could, really. Um, and then as well as that, the way it was shot, that's the thing that's really stuck with me as well. They're almost like snap snapshots of the family and their life in these camps. And when you actually look up the pictures as well, it looks like he's captured that perfectly in terms of, you know, how accurate it is. Um, and then obviously the performances on top of that there, in, particularly from Sandra Huller as uh, Rudolf Haas's wife, she's just fantastic. Like, it's, it's hard to describe her performance as fantastic, but because she's such a disgusting and horrible human being. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, th I think it's a fantastically uh, well-made film. But like, like I was saying, it's not something I'd say I'd love, but I would recommend people go to see it. Yes, Joe, like you, would I recommend someone go see this on a Friday night if they're going out either with date night or with friends? Probably not. But I do think it's a film that should be seen in the big screen. You've already alluded to this. The sound design is amazing. The, both the use of score and the absence of score. Jonathan Glazer is an expert at this. I mean, he did similar things with the use of music and score and atmosphere to create atmosphere with Under the Skin, which again like this was a film I came out and I said, I need to, to think about and I need to go away and process it. And that night, as we said, we went to see this last night. I, I came home and I was like, throughout my journey back, I was, like, I was thinking about the sounds and how there's people within, as I say, living within metres away from this, from, from my switch, are completely desensitised to it. And the only time we see the true horror is when Sandra Hula's character's, her, her mother comes to visit. And initially she thinks this is a fantastic place. And then as, I'll not go into too much detail, but there is a sequence when, and it's, again, it's, you don't see, you see a reflection and you see her response to the horror of what you see. There's sequences involving children playing what we think is, is snow, but I don't think that was snow. It's, a, it's horrific. It's, it's a tough film, but there's nothing graphic. But yet, we've just come out of World Holocaust Day. We still have things going on in the world right now. This is not depressingly as far in the past as, as we think. It's like when people talk about slavery and things like that. These things are not as far removed. And I think it's important that these films and others like Schindler's List, Son of Saul, are, are there to remind people that these horrors happened. A fantastic film, I'd struggle to recommend. I know that James Oliver, who's a regular contributor on this show, has it as his film of the year, and I can fully understand why. I just find it a tough film to sit here in the studio to say, viewers, you, you must go see this film, but you should go see this film. It is tough. Al, what about you? I mean, I, I'm very much with you, Joe, in terms of, I didn't enjoy the film, but I really appreciate why it was made. I really appreciate that it was made in the way that it was. I mean, to kind of nearly deadpan at the beginning, tell the story of this family in a lovely house with a huge garden that incidentally was planted a year in advance so that it would be flowering and things at the right, at the right time. A lot of preparation went into kind of making it look picture perfect. And yet they are so indifferent to what's going on on the other side of that big wall. And it's only when the camera kind of pans around and every now and again there'll be a chimney and there'll be smoke or flame coming out of it depending on the time of day. And that's the reminder, and yet this family is, well, the adults are pretending that it's not there. Even though during work time, he is trying to engineer how to make even, you know, uh, cremate even more people uh, in, in a certain time. And she just wants to go on a spa holiday. You know, um, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's nearly comedic, except the sound in the background stops it from ever being funny. Just that kind of that drone and the clanking and the noise and occasionally a shot. And I mean, that soundscape just, stays with you really I mean, it's like another character and so what's on scene is not on heard and so I think it's quite chilling and just it just keeps getting worse in terms of uh, and then I kind of noticed at one point the fact that the children are more affected by it so they are not as immune they have not kind of taped themselves off from it so they are a bit unsettled and you kind of realize well yes maybe 
there is some humanity that's just been suppressed, but the adults are just pretending. I, I mean, it's sick in a way, and yet it's very weird as you watch it. It's, it's, it's kind of an important film. I mean, why they chose to make it, but I guess it's a reminder that we, we could continue to be inhuman to each other and do regularly are, probably yeah. in this country and in many others. It's a fantastic film. And, you know, I don't know how to do this without seeming flippant, but we're going to move on now to something very different. This is The Zen Diary, which is going to be screened at the QFT on the 3rd of March. It's going to be part of the Japan Foundation's Touring Film Programme. Uh, I know we spoke to one of the programmers last week on the show, but now I thought we'd pick up with one of the titles. Before we share our thoughts on that film, let's play a clip. いい男ね。せろ。好きな人と食べるご飯が一番うまいじゃないか。いただきます。土を食らう。12ヶ月。うん。うん。So <笑> that's look at the Zen Dai as I say it's going to be screened at the QFT on the 3rd of March something very different. Here we have a man who is isolated, but finds himself able to reconnect with people through cooking, through the seasons, throughout the year. I, again, in a different way to The Zone of Interest, I find it a difficult, a difficult film to say you should seek this out on the cinema, but I find this as a very relaxing film to sit and watch, to sit and see someone who's going out looking for vegetables, fruit, everything, foraging, coming back, cooking and creating his food as he's writing a book. And at the same time, we suddenly come to realise that this person is struggling with grief and this is, in his way, his, his way of, of coming to terms with that. I thought it was a lovely film, and I know that sounds like I'm damning with false praise. I could even add a lovely little film. I could add in just to really damn with false praise. But I really enjoyed this, and I, I think it's an interesting film as part of this season, because the QFT, as we mentioned last week in the show, the QFT have picked nine specific titles that were available to them. This is one they've picked, as I say, it's screening on the 3rd of March. And as someone who will admit my, my, my love of Japanese cinema is mostly horror and sci-fi. That's that's it. And this is something a little bit different. So Alan, you, we've all seen this. So Alan, what do you, what's your thoughts on the Zen Diary? I felt it was a, it wasn't a stereotypical Japanese film. Now that's because we don't see very many of them, so we're not totally into it. But it was very definitely about Japan. But it wasn't that kind of same style. It, it's very relaxed. Um, there's this kind of fastidious forager, who. I mean, without spoiling the thing, he, we go through the year, effectively, and it could be through the year of his life and love and grief and so on. It could be the year of what's growing outside and what's available. He very much um, is into cooking what's in season or what he has prepared and pickled before and is now coming to fruition. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's very much a living in the moment, kind of using what you have to your hand film, which fits in with kind of modern day life and much of what we're kind of told. But it's also this interesting story of kind of life and death and love to some extent, which he expresses through food and seems to be able to spend all day making food as opposed to writing about it like he's meant to be. Um, and just the relationships, it's so gentle. Um, there are possi I mean, uh, possibly it was the time of day I was watching it and he did a little snooze, but you, you can kind of close your eyes at various points because there's not a whole lot of dialogue at certain points. There's, but you can, you can watch in your on the back of your eyelids what he's doing. You can hear the sound in the kitchen. You kind of know what he's up to. And even the outdoor kind of natural stuff of um, kind of birds going past, lots of birds, and there's a little tortoise plods across. We can hear the thump, 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 thump off its feet. You know, it, it's a very kind of much back to nature kind of thing. And I, I just, I really enjoyed it. And I don't think if somebody had said, go see mm. a film about a Japanese film about a forager that I would have like leapt up out of my seat to do it but it was well worthwhile and it, the time passed very quickly mm. but um, did it encourage me to go into my kitchen and make things from scratch did I take something out of the fridge and put it in the microwave and go ding perhaps but um, I am not going to be like uh, Sutomu and actually prepare everything from scratch but perhaps in my future I will become 
a, a little tiny uh, version of him. There's time for you, yeah. There is, yeah. You are a young, young man. Um, yeah, like you said, me watching it and kind of listening to you talk a little bit about it, to an extent, it reminds me of, of the film Chef and all that stuff that's going on in it. But it's the thing I love is, is watching someone cook and create. And there's, as you said, there's something very relaxing about that. I would say this to everyone now watching. Do not see this film on an empty stomach because <laughs> I've, I watched it slightly later than you and uh, I find myself getting incredibly hungry watching the film. So, yeah, I, I think it's... I, I loved it. I really did enjoy the film, I have to say. So, Joe, uh, before we move on, what was your thoughts on the Zen Diary? Well, even if you are not hungry, you will be hungry <laughs> watching it because I just watched it after I had some lunch. But uh, I think Alan hit the nail on the head when he said it's a very gentle film. That's probably the best sort of overarching way to describe the film just it's a very nice sort of meditative film that sort of not and doesn't just wash over you it's not really fair just to say wash over you because at times it does permeate to you when he you know the the lead character is talking about his grief and everything through his writing um again it's just something that it's just nice and easy going you can just sit and just watch him cook all day practically it's uh, it's just a wonderful, wonderful experience in that way, and it was a good insight into um, the culinary end of Japanese culture. Yeah, totally agree. So look, I think that's largely from the three of us, very positive for the yeah. Zen Diary. As I say, it's going to be screening at the QFT on the 3rd of March, and we'll have a few more of the titles as part of that programme throughout this month and into next month. But we're going to move on now, and since it is February, I will say, viewers, Alan did say to me quite flippantly when I said what we were doing this week, he looked and I love season. So, this is more about you. Well, it's more about a love season with this particular film as an example of a film of love. Well, this is the key You're thing. You're going to have to explain this. This is at some the point. key thing. I do not have to explain this to you, Alan. The <laughs> lovely Bran Mulholland, uh, local filmmaker who's also one of the people involved with the Film Devar Short Film Festival. I, I reached out to Brian and asked him to pick a film for him that defines love, and this is what Brian picked up, and here's Brian's reasons why. Hi, uh, my name is Brian Mulholland. I am the festival director of Film Devar, short film festival in Belfast, and we're ready to do our next event on the 26th of February in the Black Box Belfast. And uh, speaking of shorts, my pick for the love season would be The Red Balloon. Uh, short French film from the 50s that um, I first saw when I was off school um, sick once as a boy not too much older than the boy in the film and um, I fell in love with the movie and I think you will too it's a movie truly about uh, love and relationship and um, free to watch online I believe now so I think you should all give it a try um, I think you'll love it So that's Brian's pick. He's very busy. He's getting ready for the Film Devar Short Film Festival, as Brian probably alluded to there, the 26th of February at the Black Box. Well worth it for now. A lot of people love to go to that I event. have my ticket booked. A lot of people love to go to that, and this is, Brian has picked this for the love season, various facets, because who needs 99 red balloons when you can just have one? A little boy's love for his... Slightly, not, I can't say little balloon, slightly oversized red balloon. Short film, 1956 French short film, award-winning French short. Joe, I'll start with you first. Had you seen this before we'd asked you to review it? Right, well, firstly, I'd never seen it before, but I'm familiar with the image, you know, of the boy in the red balloon. I just wasn't sure if it was a feature film or a short film, but obviously uh, it is the short that won an Oscar. Um, I found it to be quite charming. I quite liked it. It's... Um, it's a very unusual sort of pick if you're going into love season. You know, I expected some like a rom com or something. But then when you sent me the list, I was like, oh, it's this film, okay. So then as I sat and watched, I really started to understand why it's this. You know, 
boys attached to this balloon. That's the love story, essentially. But at the same time, it's through that relationship, he sort of comes of age at the same time as he goes through the various facets of his day-to-day -day life with you know this balloon that's um, sort of sentient in a way, that it can move in its own volition. But I really liked it. I liked how the innocence of their story just is in contrast with the harshness of the environment, you know, the sort of uh, grimy streets and uh, you know, various young youth gangs running about and stuff like that. I really admired that about it. And the music worked really well within it as well. Um, but yeah, I was really charmed by it. It's a very charming short. You can, you can see the impact it's had on cinema. I mean, the closing shots are famous in their own right. And I was, when I was watching it at home, I was kind of thinking even just stuff like Pixar is up. You can, you can see all that. As, as you mentioned, the sense, initially you think it's a bit strange choice for love, but as you watch, you, you come to see why. And there's a lovely moment and again, I think it's it's well known, so I, I hope it's not too much of a spoiler. There's a great little sequence where we have a little, our little leading boy walking along the road with his red balloon, and he just happens to come across a little girl with a blue balloon, and it's it's just sweet. And like the Zendari, in the world we live in right now, it's always important, I think, to give ourselves time out for these gentle films. And I know we've started the show by talking about. The zone of interest, very different to these two, but sometimes a, f a short like this or a feature like the Zendari can just be something that you can just relax to and enjoy. Thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was a great pick from, from Brian, but Alan, as we begin to wrap up the show, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I saw it about 10 years ago. Cathedral Quarter Arts Festival showed it in Belfast Barge one Saturday morning, and I remember it would have been my... 19 year old now, so back then probably about nine, who was unimpressed with the boy <laughs> with the red balloon. Um, but there was something kind of very sweet about it at that stage. When I watched it this time, um, I mean, it, it, it kind of speaks, I mean, it speaks to me kind of in modern day stuff. It has aged, I think, very well. There's something to me about the othering within it. So you've got this little fellow who is, his badge has, he could be defined by he's the one with the red balloon who kind of wanders around, is a bit attached to it. Um, but like he gets, um, I mean, the school print, it was not only does he get bullied kind of with it, but the school principal kind of locks him in an office for a while. Um, not, you know, he goes to church and not only when the, when the balloon kind of follows them in, not only is he thrown out with his family, you know, his mother is thrown out as well. I mean, um, I mean this could be a s symbolic of being a Muslim or being gay or trans in, t in today's society, that kind of ability for other people to kind of bully you. And I think kind of towards the end when um, we'll not say how, but there is a kind of an act of solidarity, an act of mass solidarity that kind of says, although something horrible has happened to you, um, we are kind of with you, we celebrate you, there are, there's more than just you. And so, it's, so for me, in a sense, it's, it's, a, it's a weird choice for love because actually it's nearly a, a film about hate. Um, and then it, is, it becomes loving at the end when actually there's a little bit of warmth and there's a kind of a big hug for, for this thing. But I mean, it, it's, it's beautiful. And to think that in 56, this was made in post-war Paris, to think that the filmmaker just cast his son, was it Al Albert Lamarice? So it's um, We Pascal and Sabine, or the son and daughter, the, the, the boy and the girl in it. Um, and to think that they did all the balloon with physical effects. Yeah. That's not a CGI balloon. CGI didn't exist. That's not even just another layer of film put on. That's a balloon that was being manipulated out of shot. Uh, that's amazing to think of how many balloons they must have had to do it and how much planning. Um, but I think it's, it's a beautiful little thing. And I, I suspect everybody who watches it will get a different story from it. And that's the joy of, in a sense, two, the last two films, which are not that much in terms of dialogue. Lots of, you can kind of do lots of, lots of space to think, lots of space to kind of imagine what might be happening. Put your own story on it. That's good cinema. Well, you know what, Alan? Sometimes love conquers hate. Sometimes in a world, and it's films like this and the Zen Diary, and even the Zone of Interest are about why we love cinema. So there we go. I will shamelessly always bring it back to our love season. And hey, in March, we're having an Irish season because it just shows you just how much the thinking goes in here at Banderflix. But look, that pretty much wraps us up this evening. So all that's really left for me to do now is thank my two guests. So thank you very much, Al. Thanks. Thanks very much, Joe. Thanks, Jim. Thank you very much for watching. We'll be back next week with another episode. But for now, until then, goodbye.